thanks Priya and um, so good to see you and to welcome you on the conversation on Big Cats. I was um, super fascinated when I read that you had worked on The Clouded Leopard. So I wanted to connect and get you to talk a little bit about it just to introduce you. You're an independent wildlife researcher who's been working in India now for about 10 years and is fascinated by all forms of life and um, has focused on carnivores because they really, really intrigue you. In 2008, as a part of your master's dissertation, you've studied the human and ecological parameters on striped hyena in Northwest India. Hyenas are animals that we actually don't see very much. So that's a, a really great uh, talk and maybe we'll touch upon it a little, little bit. Much of your work is directed towards exploring the diverse mammalian com uh, community in Northeast India and uh, its guild of forest dependent felids, including the clouded leopard. You've also been involved in assessing the potential for cheetah re reintroduction in India. And um, just to tell you, we've had some wonderful sessions uh, discussing just that. Uh, we had Dr. Ranjit Singh and Dr. Divya Bhan Chavra and of course, uh, Dr. Chala from the Wildlife Institute and in talks with um, Elena, who is the head researcher at the Mara Meru Cheta project. And we've just, just completed all of that. So I'd love to hear um, what you did on that just again, um, when we talk at the end. You've also been the senior researcher on the wildlife um, uh, wild cat series um, on National Geographic, which is fascinating and the Wild Canid India project. So um, just absolutely fascinating. I'm so delighted to have you here. Welcome again and tell us a little bit about your work and take us through your work on clouded leopards, please. Thank you for that introduction, Latika. So, well, yes, I've done all of what you said and I think you missed out on one of uh, the topics that I worked on, which was looking at uh, the historical distribution of tigers in Rajasthan. And uh, I think that was one of the, one of the more interesting studies that I did because it was unlike most other studies I do this involved a lot of interviews it involved actually pulling out information from archives um, and putting it together and looking at uh, what we lost in a period of about 70 to 80 years um, this incredible diversity not just diversity but this well, actually diversity of species, because the study doesn't just focus on tigers, it also talks about black buck and many other species and how they were found across a large part of Rajasthan. And then with changes in policies and changes in the way we used um, our land, um, how these species just vanished um, in such short period to think of it. Within many people's lifetimes, like many people I interviewed had saw this whole process so we are talking about a single generation of human life seeing and observing this. So having said that, um, I have moved my attention lately to Northeast India, where I'm hoping uh, to make sure that this process that we saw in Northwest India and elsewhere, perhaps in India, does not repeat itself uh, and that we can, we can prevent uh, massive landscape changes of the nature that happened elsewhere in India from happening in Northeast India. And one of the species that I have been focusing on is the clouded leopard. So this picture that you see, um, remember that this is one of the finest pictures that you'll ever see of the clouded leopard in the wild. Rest of the presentation perhaps will not have pictures of this quality, you will have to satisfy yourself with pictures taken by regular camera traps which we researchers use. So I've spent considerable amount of time now I was just thinking about it about six years now looking for clouded leopards and trying to study them and study associated wildlife and other poor predators and what are the challenges that these species face and how can we prevent um, these challenges from disturbing or destroying uh, these species forever. So here is a clouded leopard 
This is a clouded leopard from mainland continental Asia. As many of you perhaps are aware and perhaps you are aware that the clouded leopard in 2006 was formally split into two species. So now we have the clouded leopard, which is Neophelis nebulosa, and then we have the Sunda clouded leopard, which is the Diadi. And the Sunda clouded leopard is restricted to Borneo and Sumatra, so I'm not going to be talking about that. I'll focus the attention of this presentation on Neophelis nebulosa, which is a clouded leopard that is found all the way from Nepal, um, Northeast India, Bangladesh, and goes up all the way to La Laos and Cambodia. So this is um, roughly the distribution of clouded leopards. To be honest, we really don't know where else they may be found, but we think at least it's found in these areas. One interesting question about clouded leopards is, are they big cats or small cats? I understand this presentation is largely about big cats. So how is it? What is this cat? Well, I like to say it's the biggest of the small cats and the smallest of the big cats. And uh, one of the interesting things about clouded leopards is that they are a medium sized cat. They don't roar like a big cat but they don't exactly purr like a small cat either. And these cats spend a lot of their time up in trees, um, or at least they are capable of spending a lot of their time up in trees. Their morphology is so well suited for a cat that can spend time in trees. They have long thick tails, which allow them to balance themselves. They have these short paws, broad paws, which again allow them to balance well on trees. They have very well-defined binocular vision so they can judge distance, distance as well. And uh, unlike any other field, they can actually come down from a tree with their head down first, like squirrels. Also, they have these very long canines, the longest canines in proportion to their skull size for any field, and hence they're often compared to a modern-day saber-tooth, or they're often called the modern-day saber-tooth uh, tooth cats. These are amongst the oldest cats that we know of because within the Pantherina lineage, lineage, these were the first cats to have diverged. So they are very old. And because of their long canines, they do predate a lot on ungulates, primates. They are capable of killing primates up in canopy. They predate upon ungulates. They also predate upon domestic livestock. So we are talking about goats, dogs, in fact, uh, Mizoram, where I work, in Lusai language, they have a very interesting term for clouded leopards. Um, the word for clouded leopard there is Kelral, and some people call it Zongral. Kelral literally translates to the goat-eating tiger, and Zongral literally translates to the monkey-eating tiger. So, and I think that's such a perfect name for the species. Actually, that's what it should be called. So, clouded leopards, also live with a diversity of other incredible species, um, especially when we talk in the context of um, India. Uh, these are species that most people rarely get to see across the Indian mainland. So we are talking about Malayan sun bear, golden cats, m marble cats, most of which you'll never see elsewhere in India. Cover an incredible range of habitats. Now you, you see these three pictures here, and the reason I've put them is because all three are from locations where in some sense I was looking for a clouded leopard or hoping for a clouded leopard and they're found in all three of these locations. If you see it's a combination of mountains, dense forest and water and which also means if you're looking for clouded leopards you have to navigate this terrain and all the obstacles that come with the terrain. My search for the clouded leopard actually began accidentally in 2011, I was doing a survey with several other colleagues in Nagaland. We were in this remote village along Indo-Myanmar uh, Indo border and we came across the skin, which I'm holding here. It was so fresh, it, still, it was still moist. It had maggots coming out of it. And the hunter who shot it said he shot it, not because he was actively looking to shoot something, but he was just walking to his field and he saw this cat and it was no hunting season um, which is something the community decides there and he said because he wasn't actively looking for something uh, it didn't matter whether it was no hunting season or not he had his gun with him he shot this cat 
at that point i wasn't even sure if this was a clouded leopard because my knowledge of clouded leopards was so limited so i looked at the skin and we thought it was a clouded leopard of course now i'm sure it is a clouded leopard uh this was followed by a study that i was doing with a colleague in eagle nest wildlife sanctuary in arunachal pradesh and uh, we had several camera traps out for this study and we got we we heard of somebody's goat having been killed by a predator an unknown predator we put a camera trap out and next day we got a picture of just two ears and uh, and a little bit of a head i wasn't sure what this cat was i thought it was a clouded leopard but we couldn't be certain uh, based on that picture of course today after having gone through thousands of clouded leopard camera trap images i'm certain that that was a clouded leopard so that was the second clouded leopard that i came across or got very close to seeing and this was followed by watching a documentary which came out around the same time called the return of the clouded Le- leopard which traces the story of these two cubs that were picked up from a market in assam and uh, the forest department confiscated them and gave them to wti who then raised them in captivity and finally released them out in the forest in the wild and i thought that was a very fascinating description of these uh, of this cat and that's the first time i actually spent so much time watching this cat um so and of course i was hooked in in many ways uh, to this beautiful creature uh, but i wasn't sure if i was ever going to study a species like this especially given that science requires data um and data on clouded leopards is something uh, that you would never really get in enough quantity to be able to do good science which means you know good statistics and come up with conclusions uh, and evidence so just around this time i was offered a position in a project which was going to look at clouded leopard ecology across their range which is which means looking at clouded leopards all the way from nepal to laos and borneo and sumatra and i thought this was a project that i couldn't say a no to besides it was a project that was professor david mcdonald's dream project and and yes without giving it any thought i said yes i'll do it um, but i wasn't sure where i was going to find clouded leopards in those numbers in india to be able to do good science so started my search for a field site and luckily this was the two organizations that were actually handling this project uh, ecosystem india and wild crew uh, both had very flexible uh, people uh, my advisors were very flexible they were incredible people to work with because they gave me the option of choosing a site that i felt comfortable in and the only site i would feel comfortable in was a site which would give me adequate amount of information on this cat so we did a survey a short survey in pakke and although pakke there is adequate evidence of clouded leopards and i could have done the study there i chose to do it in mizoram uh, in dampa tiger reserve where also i did a survey and the reason i chose dampa over pakke was only because there were already a lot of researchers working in uh, pakke and there was nobody working in dampa primarily because the terrain in dampa is very hard to access and the logistics were difficult and um, so i thought of working in dampa but um if you look at this map roughly this is this describes what northeast india is for those who don't know what it looks like and the red dot there is what i'm going to focus rest of my presentation on this man here that you see putlana um it, most of you would find it near impossible to pronounce his name and so did i so putlana is the person who introduced me to dampa he was he is one of those rare forest officers i've met because he is the only forest officer who actually walked with me into dampa we walked about 12 kilometers um he showed me what his park in his words uh, was all about so as the field director of dampa he introduced me to dampa and he was not le- he was not easy to to deal with he was a strict person uh he looked at me and he said if you want to work here you have to walk like this there are no roads here you carry everything on your back 
and and you have to be loyal to this place well i have been loyal to this place ever since because if it has or since it had a field director like this i i just thought that this place was worth protecting and worth being in so tampa became the site where i was to conduct my first independent study on clouded leopards and um, i had very simple research goals um, the goals were to estimate populations of clouded leopards um, which was um, a bit um, idealistic and uh, the second one was to look at how different poor predators or different different felids how do they coexist in this landscape at that point i didn't even know if i was going to get adequate pictures of other felids i didn't even know what other felids were found here and i'd hypothesized that um, similar sized felids would either have spatial avoidance or they would have temporal avoidance because they would not want to be with one another and of course as one moved towards the edges of the protected area um the the density of the felids would decrease i used um, a tool which is now commonly used to estimate populations of carnivores which is camera traps and um, so i had uh, 160 camera traps which is about 80 pairs and they were placed across an area of about 85 square kilometers so let's say roughly one camera trap one pa- pair of camera trap um one pair of camera traps every square kilometer and um, and i had them out for about uh, 75 days on an average each camera these cameras are motion triggered and as an animal walks past the camera's fire and you get both flanks of the individual and that's how you can actually create histories of, of which they which individual came at which camera trap location and if you see sometimes you get these obliging individuals like this one he's called i called him cl025 because that was his code and you can see how perfectly he came and kept moving in front of my camera in exactly the same way and so it was possible to identify him and similarly many other individuals we had uh, you can see, the numbers are all given out here so you can see we had about 84 uh, independent clouded leopard photo captures which is uh where independent photo capture means you have a photo taken by both sides of the camera or by both cameras or a photo taken by one camera so if both cameras fire at the same time that photo is not counted as those are not two photographs it's one photograph so actually i had about 160 plus photo captures but they they were condensed into 84 photo captures and for clouded leopards and i did the same for marble cats because interestingly we had some good data on marble cats as well and this was translated or this came down to condensed into 10 individuals and a uh, lot of photos are usually blurry you saw the quality of photos i was getting and uh, camera traps that we use for research purpose are not as expensive as professional camera traps that photographers use so so these uh, these don't produce great quality pictures and sometimes when the individual moves fast you may get a blurry picture or if an individual uh, doesn't come at the right angle you may not get a picture which you can use so you really need the animals to cooperate and the cameras to cooperate simultaneously many times it doesn't happen so you end up with fewer pictures than what your cameras may have taken and uh, we used some sophisticated statistical tools and software and estimated populations of both clouded leopards and marble cats we used a bayesian uh, uh, method to estimate populations and we also used a ma- maximum likelihood based approach um these generated uh, density estimates they also as est- uh, generated estimates of uh, numbers of individuals and uh, we got a sigma sigma is basically it can be roughly translated to the amount of distance moved by an individual per day and this is in meters so roughly these densities were uh the the estimates of densities for clouded leopards were about 4.14 and that for marble cat was 5.03 now these may seem really low but the truth is that these are amongst the highest we have recorded from anywhere in the world so yes um these are about 5 per the estimates are about 5 per 100 square kilometers um for both clouded leopard and marble cat we also got 
information on uh, the other three fields found in that area which is marble cat golden cat and le- leopard cat um, marble cat and golden cat are hard to find in most forests of northeast india also so this is interesting data and what we found then uh, was really interesting because we looked at how do these cats uh, sp- uh, temporarily how they separate themselves out or do they have an overlap in their activity and what we found was that marble cat and leopard cat showed complete avoidance in terms of time so while marble cats were almost entirely diurnal leopard cats were almost entirely nocturnal which is something you'd expect in similar sized felids uh, because they are separating themselves out in terms of time and for golden cat and uh, clouded leopard which are also kind of similar size the pattern of separation in terms of time was not as striking and the reason for this is perhaps because they were spatially separating themselves out but if you want to know more about that i suggest you read the paper which i've cited below and you'll get more information on that so having said this um the next thing is now given we are given that we are focusing on dampa at this point um and uh, the problems that dampa faces or the lands you know the, that landscape in general faces uh, those problems are not just limited to dampa but they are kind of similar across northeast india and across regions which are home to clouded leopards so we are talking about um, you know meghalaya we are talking about parts of nagaland arunachal pradesh and these are the general problems hunting of direct persecution of clouded leopards persecution of prey uh, basically hunting of prey for meat um traps traps are i i consider traps worse than anything else um when it comes to animals in the forest the reason being many times these traps are just left out and people don't even go to check them again and and sometimes they end up finding species that they weren't even expecting in those traps so here you can see my field assistant uh, laltan puya uh, he's he's one person who's taught me more about that landscape than anybody else i know uh, he is sitting here and showing me a snare this is the first time i'd walked into dampa and he showed me what a snare looked like uh, you see coal mining in fact that's an area where somebody told me to go look for clouded leopards because they they said there are cloud, clouded leopards in that landscape when i went this is what i saw and that picture you see on the side uh, on the right side at the bottom um it may look like mist rising uh from hills in the morning but it's actually jhum fires and while jhum by itself may not be so detrimental to wildlife in these areas the fact that a lot of these areas are by now being cleared and now you have plantations you have monoculture plantations of oil palm or erica replacing um natural vegetation that is damaging to clouded leopards and other all other biodiversity so what is the road ahead uh for this cat well the interesting thing here is that southeast asia and northeast india that entire landscape or that entire region of Indi- of asia which supports clouded leopards is also one of those areas which is under massive challenges in terms of deforestation it is it has higher rate of deforestation than many other parts of the world and in fact one of the highest rates of deforestation is right here and these are areas that also have high hunting pressure and monocultures coming in and these are areas that also support the clouded leopard now very often in india itself we believe that tigers are what signify uh, how rich that forest is or how well protected that forest is the truth is that tigers are being introduced or there are proposals um being prepared to reintroduce tigers or to introduce tigers into areas where today there are no tigers in northeast india but there are clouded leopards and how this is going to how the presence of tigers going to interfere with the clouded leopard we really don't know but in many ways i believe that i could get the kind of data i got in dampa only because clouded leopards were highly terrestrial there in the absence of a bigger predator and we have actually this unique community of felids in dampa which is which comprises of clouded leopards marble cats and golden cats 
which you don't find anywhere else in India. So instead of protecting and preserving this unique diversity of life, we want to bring in tiger because we believe tiger, the presence of tiger is the only way we can judge the protection levels of an area. Um, this is something that we really need to think about because clouded leopards are truly the tigers of treetops. These are cats that are capable of hunting in, in the canopy, high up in the canopy, um, which is indicative of the fact that they, these cats can survive in tropical forests, the kind that are found in Northeast India. So they can hunt up in canopy, they, they can feed on barking deer down below in the understory. Um, these cats have an incredible ability to hide from hunters. Given the kind of hunting that happens in many of these areas, I can't believe that clouded leopards still survive. And one of the reasons perhaps is because these cats spend so so much of their time just moving from branches to branches instead of even coming down on ground. Um, also, they are just well adapted to that habitat and, and those landscapes. So I feel there has to be more, more attention uh, given to the clouded leopard. And especially at this point, when you know the world is going through this recession, economic recession, or it's it's headed towards an economic recession uh, because of COVID-19, how this is, what this will mean for a species like the clouded leopard uh, is, is something we need to give some thought to. Uh, we need to think about iconic flagship species like the clouded leopard, which truly represent the predators of tropical forests the kind that exists in Northeast India. So having said that, I'm hoping that some policymakers somewhere will hear this presentation and, uh, and will think about this and consider the importance of this species, which is, which is found across Northeast India, or at least we hope it is. And I just want to make sure that um, uh, we have the slide up, uh, which is all these organizations and people have been with me through this journey of four years where I've tried studying clouded leopards and uh, I want to thank all of them. Super. Okay. So we have um, the study that I was talking about by Sahil and um, in Dibang and there we have tigers with clouded leopards and um, a lot of golden cat also. Um, from what I could see, how does it how, the, how does the data from there compare with the data from the area that you studied? So Sahil's work is unique, and it's also unique because of the community he's working with there. So it seems the Edu Mishmis make an effort to protect tigers, and they do not hunt tigers because it's a taboo. Uh, whereas the landscapes that I'm talking about. Uh, may not have had those taboos and hence we are talking about something uh, a natural phenomena or a cultural phenomena which may have already impacted populations of say species like tigers there so once now we have a situation where tigers are in very few numbers or they almost don't exist um, and uh, we have this community of smaller cats uh, which are sort of replacing the tiger. So for instance, I think the Bang Valley, they don't have the kind of marble cat populations that we have in Dampa landscape. So there's always some species which is here, which is not there. Also, the Bang has the elevational gradient, which Dampa doesn't. Dampa ranges from about 150 meters, it goes up to about 1100 meters. So we don't know what other factors come into play when it comes, when we talk about, you know, this the availability of prey, uh, what prey can support what species, the hunting that has already gone in and species that have already been brought to extinction, um, the idea is to bring in a new predator, how these cats and this community of cats, how is it going to respond to the presence of a tiger needs to be thought about. And instead of spending the crores that we are going to spend on tigers, how about protecting uh, the, the existing species with that kind of money? Yeah very important okay we also have very little information on clouded leopards so is anybody actually doing any for instance telemetric studies to see home ranges and dispersal and you know the use of corridor connectivities to move out what what do we know about all of this so that's a very very good question and a very relevant question data from this study that i conducted in Dampa. Uh, was 
pooled in along with data from studies from across Southeast Asia. So there were teams from Pi Crew working in all parts of Southeast Asia, practically every country which has clouded leopards, and all of this data was pooled in together. And uh, and actually, that paper was published a couple of years ago, uh, and it talks about what are the variables that actually influence um, the distribution of clouded leopards. And an interesting finding from that study was that. Uh, that uh, closed canopy forests are the most important determinants of clouded leopard presence. So, for species like clouded leopards, it's hard to do standalone studies because you may not get adequate data to actually come up with uh, with reliable inferences. So, here we do need to pool in our data, or we do need to conduct studies across across large landscapes. And and so, White Crew did a great job with it um, because we have we have. Uh, an increased understanding of clouded leopards um, across their their distribution, and uh, now already uh, Dr. Andrew Hearn has started a telemetry study with the Bornean population. So he's working with the Sunda clouded leopards in Borneo, where he has them collared, and I think data has just started trickling in. Give it another two to three years, and I'm very hopeful we'll know a lot more about clouded leopards. But again, I don't know how the the economic recession um, is going to impact some of these ongoing studies because many of these studies are not supported by governments. They are supported by individual. I mean, they're supported by philanthropists or by donors. And I don't know how COVID is going to impact the ability of donors to give this kind of money. Yeah. That's been something that's been a recurring theme, and we've been talking about this. The other very important thing um, that we were, I was discussing with another colleague of mine, um, who's uh, I, I don't know, you must have come across him, Christy Williams. Do you know Christy? Yes. So, but yeah, so Christy and I did our doctorates together, and um, we were talking about this, and we were talking about how uh, there is a tendency for scientists to stay within. A community and um, all of this really important information never actually gets out to stakeholders who are the true guardians of the cats. So, is there anything that you do to actually give that information back to people in in the Northeast that could influence policy, that could influence decision making? Have you ever done any presentations like that or shared information? I would say I have been making an effort uh, that my research goes out to public as much as possible, specifically public in Northeast India and in Mizoram particularly because that's where I work. So uh, there are a few journalists who have been picking up our work and they have been uh, publishing it in Mizo new newspapers. Uh, and I personally believe that because of that, uh, information on clouded leopards has improved uh, considerably because um, about two years ago or three years ago there was a case where a clouded leopard uh, had uh, gone into somebody's uh, chicken coop and had killed um, several number of chicken over a period of time and uh, and then somebody from the forest department called me to inform me of this and they asked what they should be doing uh, and uh, well you know I had suggestions but of course they were not implemented and the clouded leopard was picked up from there, uh, brought to the zoo, and then from the zoo it was brought to Dampa and released there because they believe Dampa is the safest place for clouded leopards now. So what I was saying was that, um, you know, so the forest department also does communicate whatever is happening with clouded leopards. Um, you know, usually they will inform me of what whatever is happening. But uh, and at, at a local level, also people are starting to realize that there are clouded leopards in their area and that these cats, um, in some sense, they are representative of the forest that they live in. However, having said this, I believe that the kind of attention and the kind of publicity that we should be giving out is not happening. Um, I did try having um, uh, so I've I've been trying to push forth this idea of having these football tournaments uh, in the area where I work. Um, and the reason for the football tournaments was mainly that uh, I wanted to engage the younger kids and the boys primarily into doing something other than hunting because otherwise they're out with their slingshots and catapults hunting birds. 
um so i wanted to pull them away from that and the only thing that i thought or that i felt was going to draw them more than catapults and uh, hunting was uh, football uh, so so i started getting them to play football to, uh, games and um, and we would use um uh one species of carnivore or any other wild species as um, the team mascot so i would give clouded leopard as a mascot to one team and tiger to another and so on and so forth and uh, yes uh, it's interesting how they look at it i mean of course they think it's really funny but some of them have now started accepting it as part of their game ritual and i'm hoping that you know if we continue doing this for several for some more years uh, they will realize and they will probably provide the same kind of protection um that a mascot a football team mascot deserves to these species in the wild as well fantastic okay so um you brought up um a very important issue which i don't think we've discussed today uh which is human wildlife conflict uh more more importantly clouded leopard and um humans do clouded leopards adapt to living around human habitations easily I don't have an answer to that question. We've had few cases where people have reported clouded leopards coming and attacking their chicken coops and sometimes occasionally somebody's dog gets picked up but it's not something that I hear of often um because even if you look at a protected area like Dampa animals prefer not going to the to the edges they prefer not going into villages they prefer avoiding humans um and uh, and there is a lot of prey within dampa within the protected area the core zone of dampa uh, it does have it has five species of ungulates it has gaur which is which is i think unheard of in northeast india it has gaur it has sero barking deer sambar wild pig so it has it has i mean not that clouded leopards are going to predate upon gaur but yeah. still it has it has a vast diversity of it has um uh galley forms it has uh, you have peacock pheasants you have uh, jungle fowl caliche pheasant so it has there is a lot of food for clouded leopards within the forest so it's unlikely that an individual is going to come out but the incident that occurred occurred north of aizol about 60 kilometers north of aizol and uh, and i suspect there will be areas where there will be deforestation and complete changes in large at a landscape level and clouded leopards may may run short of prey and they may come into human areas and perhaps predate on livestock so you know we've talked of um, the clouded leopard living with its smaller cousins and we've talked of the clouded leopard living with the tiger but the one animal we haven't mentioned yet is the leopard does the leopard and clouded leopard do they use the same areas do you find leopards there do you know anything about their relationship so i am a bad person to ask this question uh, or i am the wrong person to ask this question the reason being uh during the camera trapping that i did in dampa which was in 2014 15 then again in 2017 and then again in 2019 uh i have never got a uh, got a leopard on a camera trap In fact the last photographic evidence of a leopard that we've got from Dampa is from I think 2011 or 12 and uh, in 2019 I did come across maybe one or two scats which I think are leopard scats uh, but uh, but we are still awaiting results from the lab um, DNA results so we we are waiting for the molecular results and only then will we will we be able to confirm if those are leopard samples But the fact is that even if there are leopards in Dampa they are in such few numbers that they wouldn't really interfere with clouded leopards at in an ecological sense mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but in Manas mm-hmm. uh, there was a study conducted which looked at both clouded leopard populations and leopard populations and um, and they had very high clouded leopard populations by very high i mean on a relative scale on a global relative scale uh um, their clouded leopard populations were almost the same as those found in dampa or those estimated from dampa so manas has both it has clouded leopards and leopards and at that point tiger numbers were very very low they were almost insignificant 
but now i think tiger numbers have gone up in manas and i think that's why manas makes for a great ecological laboratory to answer some of the questions you are asking what happens when the bigger predator numbers go up what happens to clouded leopards so are there any, still any ongoing studies in manas yes i think there are there i think the wildlife institute of india has a study going on there and and i think aranyak may have a study i'm not sure but they may these are organizations that work there fantastic thank you i think um, this has just been absolutely incredible um it's i mean we could carry on 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 cats in the northeast forever but coming back um rewinding i was going to talk about your tiger project now and um and understand what you had done um so so i'm sitting actually in udaipur and um this is in rajasthan so the the study absolutely fascinates me because though there's been a lot of hue and cry about you know how um we've lost most of our tigers in the last um two uh, you know century and a bit um nobody's ever done a study like you have so can you tell us a little bit about what made you do the study and maybe a little bit about um some of the incidents where you went and you actually found out um you know where tigers were and what happens there today what exists in those places today so um the reason i did the study was because um because we had somebody ready to fund the study uh, mm-hmm. which is the most important thing uh, for us researchers most of the time it's not what we are passionate about or what we are what we want to do it's usually what we find funds to do so so yes wwf and mr ravi singh were very keen on supporting the study and uh, dr gv reddy who's the who's right now the prof uh, for rajasthan and at that point he was the chief wildlife warden he was very keen on the study being conducted uh, he's somebody who i really respect and look up to Uh, he's one of those rare forest officers that uh, who you just can't uh, not respect so so he he asked me to do the study and uh, because he was keen on seeing what results we'd get and i agreed to do it because i don't say no to him for most things so and uh, and yes then it meant uh, sort of figuring out what Uh, I wanted to ask, and how we could collect this data in a systematic fashion. Because otherwise, you know, if you go talking to people casually about where tigers were or how many tigers, you know, your ancestors may have shot, uh, the numbers can, you know, sometimes they're very vague and sometimes they're unbelievable and unrealistic. So the idea was to um, collect information from multiple sources and then cross-check um, and confirm the figures in some way. uh which was a bit challenging but but luckily we you know we have the state archives in bikaner and um it has uh, these documents which were submitted by the princely states at the time of independence so so i could access those documents and uh, also i found a very supportive person at the state archives mr mahender singh uh, who was more than happy to give me access to these documents so basically what I think everything came together so well. We, I found people who who opened up their homes and gave me access to libraries. There were people who were willing to be interviewed and give information, and uh, and so and then we had the state archives and we had the forest department information, whatever information they had. So all of this information was put together, and we managed to get the study. Um, we managed to produce this study, but. what was really interesting was um, looking at records of tigers from the kota bundi udaipur chitorgarh landscape uh there were records of tigers from practically that entire area that entire region and today when you go there there's not a single tiger left so the big question was what happened to tigers here and and of course i would urge people or I would suggest that they read this report to see what happened because there is no straight answer uh, for this. A lot of political decisions and a lot of policy-related decisions uh, are greatly responsible for tigers disappearing. But also, in some sense, the kind of protective attitude of a lot of ruling elites who didn't want to give up these animals, uh, who didn't want to part with these animals. 
uh, is also responsible to some extent. So, so one is that. But since you asked me to name some places or at least one place where there were tigers at one point, and today, the, you know, there, there may there may not not be any tigers. Um, two places that come to mind when I talk about that are one is um, a painting that I saw. It, it's a mural in Bundi Fort um, of uh, obviously a king uh, because this figure is sitting in in an odi and he is um, he's firing at a tiger or at least he's got he's not he may not be firing but he has his gun uh, in his hand and he's looking at um, these there's a tiger drinking water at this water hole. Now this water hole exists today and I happened to go to that water hole before I went to the port and saw this mural. The water hole is probably a tourist destination. Um, I'm guessing it's a tourist destination by the way it looked. I don't know what real purpose it serves uh, but I think it's a tourist destination and it was full of garbage. Um, there was garbage all around, there was no water in the water hole um, and the building was collapsing. Um, so and this is very close to Bundi town. So this was one of those places and another place where there were tigers and actually there were tigers then they went extinct then they were reintroduced in the 1920s which is epic because nobody today we spend millions and millions of rupees in bringing tigers into an area this was done in 1920s by a princely state Dungarpur so I went and saw the forest where the tigers were and I couldn't believe that there were tigers roaming wild in that forest because it's so close to Dungarpur town. Dungarpur town is almost encroaching into this piece of forest today. So those two places really stood out. Fantastic. Okay, now um, going back one more step, your work in hyenas. Um, you know, in India especially, they're eyed with a lot of suspicion. Um, they're not the most popular animals, um, you know, that you can find. I've had um, many an occasion where I've sat and watched um, hyenas at their dens, hyenas with their babies. They have an incredible social system. And, um, and then I was very fortunate because I was in Ethiopia. And uh, there's this whole amazing way that they view hyenas. And I don't know if you've seen this um, photograph of mine. Yeah, um, you know, where I was, I met the Haina people of Harar and um, actually spent a few days with them um, and, and think. So how did you uh, start on Hainas and tell us a little bit about your work and something about these incredible animals because they're so shy and elusive in India. So um, the Haina uh, story is, is unlike any other I think that I have. So when I joined my master's program, I was determined um, that I would study hyenas for my master's dissertation, something I would never advise any master's student to do. Never beforehand decide what you're going to study and never be so obstinate about what you're going to do. Um, you, I think we, you know, today I realize the importance of having the right kind of data, being able to use the right statistical tools and publish the right way. Um, not just go because you want to study something and especially don't pick up a large carnivore for a master's dissertation. But the reason I wanted to study hyenas was because um, I was fascinated by a story I'd heard in my house several times. And the story was about my great grandfather. So he had a jagir and uh, which was in, which is basically an area from where you could, you can collect revenue. And, um, and this is a village of, uh, far north of Jodhpur district. So it's 90 kilometers from Jodhpur along Jodhpur Nagar border. And uh, and in this place, uh, there were, my great grandfather had a rule for his son, which is my grandfather. And the rule was that you can hunt whatever you wish to, but not hyenas. And uh, which was kind of funny because everybody used to laugh at my great grandfather and say, you know, why this? And he'd say, because that's my municipal corporation. They keep my village clean. So. And uh, and I used to keep hearing the story until I realized that there are no hyenas in this village and anywhere close to it. Uh, there And there's no evidence of hyenas. So that's when I got to know that. So I asked somebody where hyenas, where the hyenas went. And, and I was told that, oh, well, you know, they used to stay in these rocks. There were these crevices in these rocks. And, you know, these were like large kind of biggish crevices. So the 
animals like there were like gaps in this rock that we have there and uh, so in this rocky area in between sand dunes um these hyenas used to go in den there during the day and the temperature there used to be much lower uh, during the day so they would go in sort of uh, uh, seek refuge there and with time people started mining they started quarrying that stone for building homes and the hyenas lost their home in turn and hence they disappeared nobody knows where they went today so of course this is a story of local extinction happening uh you know right where i come from having heard this story i wanted to know where all where else hyenas are and where they could you know and what is happening with them and everybody disliked hyenas so much in my family and around my family by dislike i mean they just looked down upon them so much that i decided that i would study them and uh, and hence i went on to uh to pick it up as a dissertation topic and my advisor dr ulas karan uh he was extremely supportive of it which was strange because i was going to suggest something to him on the lines of studying some some rodents or something in rajasthan uh but he he had heard of the hyena story and he asked me if i wanted to study hyenas and i said yes and he said sure go ahead i'll support you with it so so that's how i ended up studying hyenas and um and of course it was an incredible experience because i realized how intelligent these animals are how they escape my camera traps uh they just didn't want to come before a camera and uh, and how hyenas don't just scavenge they also eat a lot of other things including they go crop raiding uh is what i figured during this period so so yes uh i thought they were fascinating and of course people around uh, did not approve of me studying them and local people also continued to you know they had a lot of stories about them they'd say um hyenas are horses of witches so basically um witches eat the soul of the of the dead animal and hyenas eat the flesh so this is like a saying that goes on you know it's sort of highly prevalent in that landscape and in that region but um, but yes i i had a fascinating time watching them and uh, and just trying to get them on the cameras and estimating their numbers fantastic i'm so glad we got to talk i mean i could just listen to your stories forever and swap tales thank you for joining us and um we'll be in touch and i hope um some day we can go and do that uh, camera trapping study in the northeast we had discussed yes lovely thanks lovely talking to you as well latika bye bye, bye. presentation called Puma mode and everyone asks me why it's called Puma mode